Hi everybody, it's uh, John back again with another Model in Box review. Today we're looking at a Focke Wolf FW190D variant, which is the long nose Junkers Jumo engine powered um, D variant of the FW190, the famous Butcher Bird. The kit we're reviewing is this one. This is the original old tool variant of the Airfix Series 1 Focke-Wulf FW190D. This is uh, the 1958 release that came out on a Type 1 header. You can usually tell a Type 1 header because it had a, a red box um, on the left hand side and the image of the kit on the right hand side. And then you had this blue scroll logo for Airfix on the top of the uh, the red box here and that's always a giveaway sign of the the Type 1 header. Um, and interesting, the decal sheet here, even in 1958, it was bereft of swash stickers. So even as early as the late 50s, you still weren't allowed, uh, although there were some actually featured on some models, because I can remember buying some and building some. I do believe the, the Matchbox FW190 PK4, um, sorry, not PK4, it's PK6. Was it PK4? It was PK4. The FW190A variant. I think that had swash stickers on the uh, the tail fin, um, on the decals on that. But the Airfix kit, had, there was no swash stickers in there anywhere at all. Um, and that was quite interesting. I, it was quite interesting to see that. 1958 Type 1 goes through to 1959. And this is a Type 2 header. Um, Interesting with the Type 2, um, you had the blue scroll label here again, but you had a band, a coloured band across the middle of the um, of the header. And the, the in this case, the aircraft is flying from the red band into a white band. Um, and that's a telltale sign of a Type 2 um, header. Um, I think this is 50D, which is 50 old pennies. So... I don't think this was actually um, priced up um, on the date it was released because I think it would have been quite a bit less than that. It would have been around about two shillings um, in 1959. Interesting to note that the FW190, I believe, is in the first 15 models released by Airfix. Um, so it is one of their very, very early kits and it's going to be included in my old school uh, video series inbox of use for you know for the model channel but that's 1959 type 2 header then we go to 1959 and airfix uh, collaborated with a company called plasti in germany who sold the airfix series one focke wolf fw190d um, and it's exactly the same model you, you get with the uh, with the airfix kit it's just sold um, in the german market through this company plasti um, which is it, it's interesting to see the the logos there and you know the the actual pa packaging the marketing packaging it's quite interesting to see that so that's 1959 then in 1966 this is Airfix Corporation of America the American agent to sell uh, Airfix models in America I have had quite a few comments on some of my inbox of you uh, comments lists. Um, that the Airfix Corporation of America plastic was a little bit substandard to regular Airfix kits plastic. Um, so if you do have one of these in your stash, it's probably better to um, to keep it in your collection rather than build it. Um, yeah. But anyway, that's 1963 and the Airfix Corporation of America's FW190D. Then in 1966, Airfix by Craftmaster also released this kit in the American market. Um, same artwork um, as the Airfix Corporation of America um, and it's the same kit inside everything's identical decals everything the whole lot is all exactly the same and again the plastic on these kits were as inferior as they were with the original um, Airfix Corporation of America kits it's always better to build a kit from Airfix itself, Airfix packaging itself from, from Britain. Anyway, that's 1966, and that's the Craftmaster variant. Then you go into 1967, and this is the model that I've got um, to inbox of you. I'll be doing this kit. It's on a Type 3 header from 1967. 
Um, again, it's exactly the same kit as it had before, same markings, same everything. Um, and it's going to be an interesting build, this one, to see this. But that's the uh, the Type 3, the famous red stripe kit. It's still marked as an FW190D. And it's still interesting to see that they've got this elongated Airfix scroll logo with 72nd scale on the flag there. That's quite nice. That's the Type 3 red stripe header from 1967. And then in 1969, Airfix started to release... Um, their second stage range of dogfight double kits. These were the models that covered uh, mainly kits from the Second World War and some post-war models as well. Um, and the Stormovic and the Focke-Wulf FW190 uh, were incorporated into a dogfight double in Series 3. This, of course, being because the Aleutian IL-2 is a Series 2 kit and the Focke-Wulf is a Series 1. Um, yeah, and if you can get hold of one of these in your stash, it's very collectible and they are fetching quite a bit of money now. So that's 1969's Dogfight Double of the FW190, complete with the Aleutian IL-2 Stormovic. Then in 1969, Airfix Plasti re-released this kit um, with the original Type 3 header in a sort of a, a boxed packaging. Um, and they just used the Type 3 header from the Type 3 release kits from Airfix as the instruction label and paint guide and everything um, inside the box, which, well, you, you know, it's very simple, isn't it? That's 1969, Airfix Plasti, release of the FW190D. And then in 1972, MPC um, released a what's called a profile series of the Focke-Wulf FW190D. This uh, incorporated three separate, completely different decal options um, for the FW190 um, it shows you exactly where these aircraft were based and when when they flew most of them, these two are 1944 this one's 1945 and these are quite collectible it's interesting actually that General Mills um, were involved with MPC I didn't realise this I've just noticed the label for General Mills General Mills were of course the company that purchased Airfix in the early 1980s um, and sold the Airfix kits marketed by Panatoy um, and you'll see that in a minute very soon. So that's 1972 profile series pack for MPC. Um, then we go through to 1973 in the Type 4C header. This is the famous blister pack. Again, exactly the same decals in the packaging. This one's been quite ye yellowed. Um, it's going to be interesting to see uh, what mine are. I think mine are actually, this, my kit's in better condition than this one. You'll see in a minute exactly what I mean by that. Um, but the Type 4C header um, was the famous blister pack and that was released in 1973. Then we go into 1973's MPC second release of the Profile series. This is exactly the same kit that he had before, released through General Mills' ownership of MPC. Um, but it was just re-released in 1973. So um, no difference there, really. Then in 1974, MPC released a new release kit of the FW190D, this time with five crew figures. Um, I'm not sure what the crew figures were, but it looks like one is obviously some sort of officer and the other four crew members are um, service personnel um, for the aircraft. And the aircraft also came in a completely new style of decal with swash stickers on it which is interesting so there you go photo of actual kit um, and that's the one uh, 72nd scale 1974 release from MPC of the Focke-Wulf FW190D with five crewmen then in 1976 you had um, the Type 4D boxing and this was Airfix's change to try and get all their models released in boxes um, and the FW190D was no exception. Um, these were released in 1976, just prior to what I call the planetoid label style boxing. Um, and it's it's an interesting... Oh, I've always quite liked this image, actually. It, this image was current on all the models released from 1967 with the Type 3 red stripe label. Prior to that, of course, you had the... Um, the pictorial image rather than the painting. That's 1976, Type 4D boxing there. And then in 1976B, 
This is the 1976 second generation. This is the kit um, that replaced, it was like a retooling of the original FW190D and this was a pure D9 variant on a Type 4C header. And I think this kit was actually released um, along with a lot of older stock of the original tooling kits because the Type 4C were released prior to the Type 4D when they came out in boxes. Um, and you can get this on a Type 4D boxing as well, but this one is a Type 4C. So it must have been released concurrently with the other kit when it was released in a box or even in a blister pack. Um, but this is the new, the like the newer tool model that was released in the mid 1970s. I'll just leave you with a nice image there of a D9 Dora. Um, and one of the reasons why I wanted you to have a good look at this particular image is because of the placement of this oil cooler here. Um, this oil cooler on the model is in a different place to what it is on the real aircraft. I think on the real aircraft it's it's actually a, a little bit further back, um, which is a bit of a shame really that they got that in the wrong place, but there you go. So anyway, we'll just pan the camera down and let's have a look at this really quite exquisite little, little kit. Let's pop that out of the way. Just get a pair of scissors out because I've not opened this kit up yet. The first thing you'll notice is it's in a bag kit. This is what I call the original bag kits, and the price on the bag kit is 19p. I do believe that that is the original price that was put on this kit when it was first hung up, probably in Woolworths, maybe at other model shops. But uh, Woolworths had a massive, massive pull for FX kits and a lot of sway with the company. Um, but 19 pence was the going price for FX Series 1 kits in around about 1970, 1971 when I started building models. I can remember um, 19, maybe 19 and a half pence was the price you paid for a Series 1 kit. So anyway, this kit is actually in pretty good condition. The box, the um, the header artwork is still pretty clear. Um, and if you turn the packaging over, you can see that the, in, the decals are actually in pretty good condition. They are slightly yellowed, but they're not as bad as the one that was in that photograph that you saw before. So what we'll do quickly is I'll just... Um, just pop the staples, this is like going back in time, just pop the staples on this instruction leaflet. I think I'm going to have to, oh no it's come off, that's alright. And then we'll pop the staples on this instruction leaflet, there we go. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and pop the bag, oh it hasn't popped the bag but it's, it's come out quite clean actually. I'm going to pop that one as well. That one's come out of the bag, which is great. There we go. I can now open this instruction leaflet up and try and pop that staple out of the um, instruction leaflet. Type 3 instruction leaflets on bag headers were an interesting proposition because basically this is what it looks like on the bag header. We've got a little hole in the top here to hang that on the shop um, display stands. They were always like single prongs that hung out and you just pop that over the top. Um, and you would put like anything up to 12 kits maybe on one, on one stand prong. Um, on the back you've got the information in through, in, uh, it's all in English actually, which is quite interesting. Um, I was expecting that to be in maybe one other language, but it's not, it's all in um, English. And then you've got pattern number 101. And then you open the instructions and it reveals the paint guide on the inside, decal application guide. Um, it's got the old original Airfix colours on two of the colours but not on the others. Pale blue, olive green M3 and matte black M6. Pale blue is now, now matte 25 Humbrol, olive green is matte 3, dark green, uh, sorry matte 30. Dark green, I believe, is matte 91, but don't quote me. Matte 33, obviously, is the matte black colour used by the Humbrol colour scheme. Um, yes, this kit does have a bomb. The FW190 was a fighter bomber, after all. And the other thing I find interesting about, ser about Series 1 kits that were in 
Type 3 headers is that you get the old style instruction leaflets where you've got like I mean in this case it's three build explode views but you've also got the text telling you what to do when to do how to do and what part numbers and they even IDs what every single part is for instance um, let's just have a look at this section six locate and cement the engine cowling and propeller to the fuselage and then in the first section section one it says insert the propeller shaft one through the rear of the engine cowling two and cement into the propeller number three and you can see those parts there propeller shaft i call it a retainer pin but airfix obviously called it a propeller shaft and then they're showing you that you have to put the wings in a seven degree angle dihedral which is quite nice but basically the kit builds up in four sections the fourth section being the paint guide um, and in the first section you've got quite a lot going on there with virtually the entirety of the airframe to assemble including the engine I'll probably be doing that in two different stages yeah section two you build the undercarriage the bomb assembly the cannons and I think that's some sort of aerial that sticks out underneath what's that part 18 let's have a look um, locate and cement the radio antenna beneath the port wing so, oh yeah there it is there's a little hole there it goes into that little hole and then in section three you're basically putting the oil cooler into place I'll show you the locating hole for the oil cooler so you can see that it's definitely going in the wrong place it should be going um, into a location slot that renders the front of the oil cooler above the last exhaust port exhaust um, exhaust pipe that comes out the back of the side of the aircraft and then you put the pilot in as an afterthought and the canopy goes last which is probably exactly how I'll do it um, and then on the back as you've seen before the paint guide again it even shows you how to apply the decals and everything it's it's quite self-explanatory so that's like a, a walk back in in uh, in memory lane for how they used to do it on bag kits all those many years ago um, we'll just pop this header let's see if I can pop this header I should be able to there we go it's always interesting to open a kit for the first time and have a look at the parts <laughs> never built this kit before I've seen it on on the shelf in the shops as a child many many times never built it before so anyway, let's get these two out. We'll have a look at those two in a minute, and we'll just spill out the other parts so that I can put them back in the bag as we get to them in a minute. Decals. The decals on this kit are in pretty good condition when you consider that this model is probably at least 50 years old. So it's nearly, nearly as old as me. But the reason why it's going in the old school um, is because the mould for the kit was released in 1958 so it predates me by about seven years which is interesting but the decals I mean the decals are pretty much run of a much at the time um, they're they're quite good register actually they're not bad at all um, I'm quite surprised about that not bad at all yep quite impressed with that you get a, a complaint slip let's just put that cover over the top get a complaint slip with airfix's um, complaints head office address there and held in place in london and on this side you've got basically some of the other things that airfix did at the time including um, motor ace home car electric car racing sets accessories for new artists painting by numbers better builder they were a type of lego all stuff like that though it's quite interesting and then you also got the free stand that came with every airfix aeroplane and helicopter model um, that, that was released um, and you've got the original logo there from airfix that's quite nice these are quite collectible i don't know if you know you've seen my channel i've mentioned this before um, the stands are actually quite sellable they are marketable um, you can sell them on ebay they usually go for around about two pound each i'll just show you the um the sprue first and then we'll go through the individual parts that have come off the sprue right this kit is all here I've, def I've checked already basically the parts 
you have to remember this model was originally told in 1958, so the parts are not going to be great by modern standards. But by 1958, this thing was pretty much cutting edge. Um, you know, when you think what companies were in competition with them at the time, you had Frog, you had companies like Aurora, Hawk, um, and this was almost 15 years before Matchbox even released a model. This kit was moulded and released. Um, the tail wheel there is it's okay, isn't it? It's, it's nothing to write. The parts are nothing to write home about, but it's it's okay. It's a nostalgia build for me, definitely. Um, the propeller itself, actually, I think it could have been a bit more paddle type style. I think that propeller is slightly wrong in design, but um, from 1958, it would have been it would have been more than adequate for most people. You have the annular radiator, which has a little bit of detail on it, which is quite interesting. I wasn't expecting that. This, of course, is the annular radiator for the Jumo engine. I think it's a 211D4 engine in this in this aircraft. Um, I could be wrong, but I think it's a Junkers Jumo 211 engine. You've got the, um, the canopy. The canopy on this is actually quite nice. Um, it's got a nice frame. It's pretty clear it's the right shape although the d9 variant although uh, to be honest with you this canopy actually looking at the one i've got on the, the aircraft i'm looking at on the computer the canopy is actually the wrong shape that's more like the canopy that goes on an fw190a the dora canopy was much more bulbous than that behind the front windshield it had a more bulbous edge but you know 1958 can't expect everything one of these famous guys from airfix he's a bit flash ridden um interesting that he's got something in his hands there and he's a typical airfix pilot from late 1950s early 60s that went into a fighter aircraft he's reasonably detailed he's got flying goggles and may west looks remarkably similar to the Spitfire pilot, I put in the Mark 9, uh, <laughs> but there you go. I won't need to show you those three parts, whoops, but I will need to show you these four parts. Right, tailplane. There's a lot of flash on this tailplane, I'm just going to try and show you it. There's a little tiny injector pin mark there as well, but it's quite faint, it won't really be a problem to to sand out. Um, there's one on that side as well, which is interesting, but they're not too bad, they're quite faint. And you've got a lot of flash on that tail plane there. The detail is pretty waxy and heavy as well, um, but you know, this is what you get when you get an old tall kit. Lower wing, again, you've got quite a lot of rivets on there. Um, there's quite a lot of pitted which doesn't look like detail, but I suppose you could highlight that and make it look like weathering. You could even, in theory, you could even run a slight, very fine um, sanding stick over those little pitted parts on that wing there and bring out maybe a silver underneath to try and show you some pitted weathering. Um, this is the upper wing. Again, you've got quite a lot of rivets on there as well. Um, it's quite detailed, quite raised panel lines. Um, you know, yeah, that's Rivet City with some pitting. The actual quality of the plastic parts wasn't great, was it, in those days? And then you've got you've got the fuselage half, and the other fuselage half is exactly the same as this, except that it hasn't got an oil cooler location hole. And you can see straight away, bearing in mind that the picture I'm looking at here, the oil cooler is the front of the oil cooler is definitely behind the rearmost. It's sort of slight, it's above the rearmost exhaust port, and in this kit you can see it's actually halfway down the exhaust ports. That is definitely in the wrong place. It should be much much further back than that, which is a real shame. It's a shame that Airfix got that wrong. Um, and I, is it worth me trying to sand that out? And I don't think it is. I don't think it is. The actual detail on the rear rudder is not too bad, is it? 
quite a lot of raised panel lines and rivets going down this airframe. Yeah, interesting. It's going to be interesting building this kit. As I said before, I've never built this kit before. Um, but I have seen it on the shelf quite a few times. I have built the retool kit from the mid from the mid 70s, but never this one. I think my brother built the dogfight double years and years ago when it you know on general release during the 1970s. I'm pretty sure he built the dogfight double. He built quite a lot of the dogfight doubles. Um including all of the World War One models. Um he did I'm sure he bought most of the dogfight doubles, but I only bought about three of them. Um yeah, which is interesting. Let's put all this stuff back in here so I can keep a hold of it and make sure it all stays in the bag. And then what I'm just going to do is just pop that over there. Pop that like that, because I'm going to re-staple this up. Um, I'm not going to start this kit straight away. It's going to be started at a later date. But um, probably when this video goes up, because I'm videoing this video, this video is going to be going, um, it's being recorded before um, before I start this kit, obviously. Uh, the kit we're doing an inbox review on is the Airfix Focke-Wulf FW190D serial number um, 101, and the model was released in Series 1 with a release date of 1958 in 172nd scale. There are decals for an FW190D in Luftwaffe service similar to an aircraft based at Bad Warris Chauvin in April 1945. There are 23 parts on a silver grey plastic sprue and one clear part, totaling 24 parts in total. The dimensions of the kit are roughly 5 inches long by 6 inches span, and it should sit about 2 inches high on its undercarriage. Now the options and costs, I have kept them to 172nd scale, because if I'd have gone through lots of different options and different scales, it, the list would have been endless. Um, so we've just kept it at 172nd scale and the, the options are actually quite interesting. So, here we go. Um, AZ model, these are all the standalone kits first. AZ model do an FW190 D9, which retails for about £15 to £17. Academy released an FW190 D9 for about £5 to £15. It's not a bad kit, the Academy option. Airfix's 1958 tooling series 1 kit. Of an FW190D retails for anything from seven to about nineteen pound, and they also did a 1958 tooling of an FW190D with the IL2 Stormovic in a dogfight double set. This kit retails for about fifty to fifty-five quid at the moment, and it is getting rarer and rarer. And if you have one in your stash, keep hold of it because it will appreciate in value. Airfix is one seventy-sixth, uh, one seventy-six. Sorry, that's not true. Airfix's 1976 tooling of the FW190D retails for anything from four to sixteen pound, and there's a company called Forces of Valor who do an FW190D9 for seven to thirteen pound. Hasagawa do several FW190s boxings. The standalone FW190D kit retails for ten to twenty-three pound. It's an excellent kit and well worth buying. The FW190 and ME262 combo kit from Hasegawa retails for anything from £42 to £52. Hasegawa did an FW190 D11 and 13 combo kit. You can actually build two FW190 Ds from this kit, one of the 11 and one of the Type 13. That kit retails for £33 to £58. And they also did an FW190 D9 and an FW190 A8 combi kit. Two aircraft models in the same box for twenty to forty-two pound. Hobby Boss did an FW190D for five to six pound, and Italieri did an FW190D9 for six to twelve pound. That kit isn't bad either. Lindbergh did a pretty atrocious FW190D for seventeen pound. A company called Marvi M A V I produced a vac form kit of an FW190D. No idea of the costings on that kit. Um, and it doesn't look too clever either. Mastercraft did an FW190D9 for £10. Planet Models did an FW190D11, as well as a D12, a D13, a D14, 
and a D15. They're all multimedia kits with white metal vac form and resin parts as well as injection molded parts. That kit retails for £38 to £41 and it is absolutely fantastic. RV Resin, they did an FW190 D11 and 13. They're both multimedia kits and different boxings. Anything from £17 to £20 for those two. RV Aircraft Limited did an FW190 D11, a D12, a D13. They're all multimedia kits. I think these are just resin and back form for £10 to £13. And Ravel Seji did an FW190 D9. No idea the costings on that. SMER also did an FW190 D9 for about £10 to £12. And ZTS Plastic did an FW190 D9 for £4 to £6. Some of these models have been re-released um, under different companies. AZ Model did an RV aircraft rebox kit of the FW190 D11 and 13, and that kit retails for about £15 to £16. Airfix by Craftmaster retooled the 19, uh, sorry, reboxed the 1958 tool of the FW190 D for 10 to 16 pound. Bilek did a reboxing of the Itelier Rai kit of the FW190 D9 for 10 to 17 pound. Waltersons reboxed the Forces of Valor box model kit for of the FW190 D9 for 7 to 10 pound. Hasegawa Hales reboxed the Hasegawa kit of the FW190 D9 for about £20, and Hasegawa Minicraft reboxed the same kit of the FW190 D for about £17. Heller reboxed the Airfix 1976 release reboxed kit of the FW190 D for £7 to £10, and Italeri reboxed the Italier Rai kit of the FW190 D9 for four to 25 pound. That model is really nice and very, very cheap if you hold out for a price. Lindbergh Nikomisa did a Lindbergh rebox of the FW190 D9, no pricing is available on that. MPC did an FW190 D with the five crewman set, which is a 1958 retool Airfix reboxed kit, no pricing on that. MPC also did uh, an FW190D profile series kit with decals for three separate aircraft on the 1958 retooled kit from Airfix. No pricings on that. An MPC Kokola did an, M an FW190D profile series set with decals for three aircraft of the 1958 tooled FW190D from Airfix. No pricings on that. Mr. Craft reboxed the Mastercraft model of the FW190 D9 for about four to twelve pound. Plasty and Plasty Airfix, both kits are of the FW190 D um, 1958 retooled kit. No pricings on either of those two. Tamiya reboxed the Italier I model of the FW190 D9 and the earlier release of the FW190 D for twelve to fifteen pound. Testers also released the FW190 D9, which is a reboxed Italier I kit, for 22 quid, And Svesda also reboxed on the Italier I kit of the FW190 D9 and the FW190 D in separate boxings for £9 to £10. Conclusions Right. In 1958, when the FW190 D was released... There were only 25 to 30 aircraft kits in the Airfix range, and all were to be found in Type 1 headers and boxes. These kits were very crude in some cases, but some were actually quite good, and the FW190D was a kit that fell into the reasonably quite good category. It has its faults, such as the oil cooler intake is in totally the wrong place, and the tail profile is a little off, but otherwise it's sort of okay. I've never built this kit before, so it will, I'm sure, take me back into the past, reminding me of how kits went together when I was about 7 to 10 years old. This mould is 62 years old, so it will be included in my old school playlist of inbox reviews, and with just 24 parts, I'm not expecting this kit to take very long in the making. Raised panel lines and surface detail appear to be not too severe, but will need a little bit of attention here and there. Models worthy of note are the AZ model and the Atelieri based kits, as these are very good and get praise from the pro builders and reviewers. The Planet model kits will be a little taxing to build for inexperienced models, but are considered to be the best in this scale option. 
avoid the Limburg kits as I have built one of these in the past and it wasn't a nice experience. Also steer away from the Master and Mr Craft boxings as they are truly dire too. I hope this video has been of some use. Um, if you have any questions, queries, just pop them in the comments box and I'll try and get back to you as quickly as possible if anything needs answers. Um, and uh, thanks for tuning in and I'll catch you for the next one. Thank you very much. Bye bye.